From Music for All and presented by Yamaha, welcome to Mind the Gap. On this episode, Classroom Management, we explore innovative ways for future and early career music educators to keep students engaged, reduce distractions, and open the door to more learning opportunities. We welcome Director of the Marching Blue Band and Athletic Bands at Penn State University, Dr. Gregory A. Drain. Bandmaster and Staff Non-Commissioned Officer in charge of the Marine Forces Reserve Band, Master Sergeant Justin Hauser. Retired Middle School Band Director at Fayette County Public Schools in Lexington, Kentucky, Cindy Hawkins. And Associate Director of Bands at Gulfport High School and the Middle School Band Coordinator for the Gulfport School District, D.D. Pitts. And now, our hosts of Mind the Gap, Cameron Jenkins and Susan Smith. Well, hello, hello, hello to all of our friends. We are so excited to have you with us this evening. My name is Cameron Jenkins, and we are so proud to have this conversation with you here. Look, we have friends literally from all over the U.S. that have joined us to lift up this conversation of classroom management. One of the things that I feared as a young educator, how do I make sure that the classroom is in order and that we are ready to learn? How do I make sure that I'm doing the right thing as the conduct on the box so that my students could have a quality experience. I'm excited to introduce and allow them to say hello to you. Some of my dear friends from all over the U.S. started with my sister and friend and co-moderator, Susan Smith. Come on in here, Susan, and say hello. It's never a bad day. You lift us all up. It's awesome. You make my day better. Uh, I'm Susan Smith, and I'm one of the co-founders, co-producers of this webinar, Mind the Gap. The whole thought was to bridge that gap for our young music teachers who might have lost something during the pandemic, and we're continuing to roll with it because we feel like there's really a need to, to kind of bridge that from those methods classes into those young teachers that we really wanted to encourage them. I'm a lecturer in music education at Troy University, and I'm an educational consultant for Music for All. So Teaching young teachers is, is what I do, and don't tell them, but I would pay I would pay them to let me do it. So I love what I do. We're so excited to have you from all over, as Cameron said. Dr. Drain, tell us about yourself. How you doing? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Susan. And uh, as you stated, I'm uh, Dr. Gregory Drain. I work at Penn State University. I've been here for 20 years now. That time has flown by. Uh, three years as a graduate student. Uh, working on my master's and then 17 years working here at the university. So I'm excited about this topic because like you, I was very nervous about classroom management as I was preparing to go into the teaching profession. Dr. Drain, they just kind of kept you there in Pennsylvania, didn't they? After after you did your master's, they, they decided they... Yeah, you know, huh? Penn State is a special place. You come here and you fall in love. I tell the students all the time, you spend four years trying to get out of here and then the rest of your life coming back. I enjoyed college so much that I never left. Ah. Well, good for you. Glad you're here with us tonight. And Master Sergeant Hauser, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Master Sergeant Justin Hauser. I am serving right now down here in the Marine Forces Band, New Orleans, uh, Marine Forces Reserve Band down here in New Orleans, excuse me. Uh, I am, my title is the Bandmaster or the Staff NCO IC, Staff Non-Commissioned Officer in Charge. And my role here is, uh, now is do a little conducting, but I am in charge of scheduling and keeping the band operating. Glad that you could be with us this evening. And from Lexington, Cindy Hawkins. Yes, Cindy Hawkins from the Bluegrass in Lexington, Kentucky. I am a retired uh, music educator, 33 years, and the uh, majority of my experience has been in the middle school, although I have taught 5 through 12, uh, both band and orchestra. Uh, in my undergraduate is from James Madison University in Virginia, my first three years of teaching there. And then uh, I spent two years in Texas, and then the remainder of my time has been 28 years here in Lexington. I have a master's degree from Moorhead State University uh, with Richard Miles. I'm really glad to be with all of you. This has been a wonderful experience, uh, the webinars in general, and, and I know I have received a lot of positive feedback and look forward to our conversation tonight. Wonderful, we're so glad to 
Glad to have you here. And Dee Dee Pitts, I hear you have a few stories about Cameron Jenkins for us. Is that right? Oh my goodness. He is, he is everything you see and more. He is one of my dearest friends. Um, I, I love that guy with all I have. Um, I am Dee Dee Pitts and I am the Associate Director of Bands at Gulfport High School. And I also get the privilege to coordinate all of the middle school activities in our district. We have several middle schools, a couple of middle schools, and I get to make sure that they're all on the same page and doing the, doing the right things. And uh, this topic of classroom uh, management is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I was also very new and didn't know what to do when I was coming out. And just, I'm just grateful to be able to uh, share today and, and help young teachers move in the right direction. Awesome. And Cameron, tell us about yourself. <laughs> I am the founder and CEO of Full Potential Leadership. And my mission statement is simple. It is to be a forklift and to lift up people all around me. One conversation, one interaction at a time. So that's it. It's plain and simple. And uh, we are so excited to have the conversation tonight to hopefully help some educators just think about maybe some new ways to approach classroom management. And um, whether you are conducting a middle school, which I love middle school, that's my heart. Oh my goodness. I, I have such a bias. I know, I know. A high school, college, or even the professional ensemble, uh, we will get into uh, so many different ways to approach um, classroom management and rehearsal management. How do we really make good use of our time? And, and one of the things I like to start with is just the idea of how do we maintain, how do we build and maintain a positive classroom climate? How do we do that? So I want to kick that conversation off by starting with my sister and friend, Dee Dee Pitts. Uh, Dee Dee, how would you describe building and maintaining this positive culture for your students? Um, thank you, Cameron. First, uh, I will say that a positive classroom culture comes from having positive relationships with your students. Uh, and that relationship is built from day one. Um, having clear expectations of students and having clear rules and procedures are always, uh, always good, but it starts with that relationship. If they know that you are there for them and, and that you care for them and that you want nothing but the absolute best for them, and you do that in a positive and caring way, then you're already miles ahead in building uh, that positive classroom culture. And then you just have to maintain it through consistency. Mm, consistency, not just being one way one day and then changing the game but consistently being there for the students. I want to continue that thread of how do we build and maintain this positive uh, climate in the classroom and rehearsal space, starting with my friend uh, Cindy, then going to Dr. Drain. Cindy, what would you say? How do we maintain this kind of positive culture? Well, patience and persistence really are the key. And to any discussion we have, it's always about communication. You need to learn their names. And if you can't remember their name, you need to look them in the eye and say, please tell me your name and then really soak it in so that it's not, hey, you or oh, cutie or redhead or whatever that might be. You know, you, you're, you're communicating with them and making, making them feel like they're important to you, that they're not just one of 50 or one of 15. They are important. Uh, speaking to them about other uh, interests that they have besides why they're in your classroom, band, orchestra, choir. Um, I remember personally it was a sad day for me when my school decided to go to a dress code because I loved understanding my kids' interests through their t-shirts. And I'm, I love sports. I am a big sports fan of all kinds. And, you know, when I can identify, you know, with a Big Ten conflict or, you know, the Green Bay Packers playing the Bears this weekend, you know, any of those kinds of things, kids kind of light up. It's like, oh, you, she's a real person. She's not just in room 117. And so the, pers the persistence of doing that, and, you know, and not all teachers are of that nature. And so they kind of back up a little bit and of course I'm talking mostly middle school because that's the majority of my experience but they you just have to keep you know trying to help them warm up a little bit and then you come to find that there's more you know as it's like peeling an onion you know you're getting to know them more and more and that's just incredibly important the music part comes you know once you have their attention and and they have your trust and you have their trust. I love that. And you know what? So it just makes my heart shine because I know what happens in middle school world. It translates. And you talk about getting to know them, peeling back the onion. That translates even to college. Dr. Drain, come on in here and talk from the collegiate standpoint. How do you build and maintain this positivity? You know, uh, I'm listening here to my colleagues and it's I don't think it matters what grade level they're in. 
you know, all of the things that they have just said are things that I utilize as well. Uh, as, as Cindy just stated, saying their name. I have 320 students in the marching band and I pride myself on knowing their name and saying their name every opportunity that I get, you know, even in, in all of my classes. In the symphonic band, we have about 65 students just saying their name. But one other thing we're talking about, as you said, maintaining that positive uh, culture within the classroom. One thing that I personally like to do is I like to greet my students as they walk into the room. And, and for me, I get to see, I, I can see that, you know, what, you know, if they, if they have some concerns on their face, I'm like, hey, what's going on? Uh, and, oh, man, I just took a test and it was difficult, you know, and I talked to them about their test or whatever uh, may have just happened. Or you seem extremely, uh, you know, uplifted today. You know what's going on in your life and just having those conversations uh, with your students, because it is so easy for them to go around school all day and be unseen. I want them to know when they come into a classroom with me, they will be seen, they will be heard. And I just try to find every moment that I can to, to engage with them in some way, shape or form. But most importantly, say their name. Absolutely. I love it. I know. Dr. Drain, I, even on a college campus, I walk by a student and they're just expecting me not to speak to them. And I speak and they light up because seeing someone see them and uh, every day we can do that to really encourage them. So we've been through this COVID thing and we know that classroom management is a huge challenge right now because they mostly don't know how to school, right? They, they don't know the parameters of things because they're doing it and, and these expectations and how we continue to, to build those and, and know, you know, there's like no institutional memory about what we do in the music class or there's nobody to follow. So how do we continue to build those expectations and keep things positive? DB, we'll go to you and then the master sergeant probably after that. Um, so one thing that, that we like to do in Gulfport and on a daily basis is just to make sure that staff, like it, it starts at the top. So everything that we do, we have to understand that it trickles down from us down to our students. Uh, so we like to make sure that we're in a good headspace and that we understand what's going on around us. We, we kind of keep everybody up to date. This just happened on this group and this happened with these kids. We got the ACT happening. Um, so just keeping the perspective of what's going on and, and understanding that we're not the only thing that's going on uh, in these kids day to day life uh, is is part of what we like to do. And then we have to remind ourselves to reinforce procedures and not get upset when they forget them. Um, a lot of times as, as a young teacher, I I would have a have a rule that should have been a procedure and I would get upset when the kids didn't do what I thought they should do. And I was like, well, why didn't they? And it was simply because it was something that should have just been a reminder for them. It's a reminder of how we of how we inner class. It's not something that we get upset. It's just a reminder. Hey, let's remember that when we come in, we need to be quiet or let's remember that when, if we want to speak, we need to raise our hand, nothing. And, and we don't lose our cool. We don't, we don't, you know, you raise our voices and things of that nature. And if they see that we are just as accommodating uh, to them about, oh gosh, I forgot to do that the right way. And we're not going to jump all over them. It's just maintaining that positive flow of relationship with them and helping them understand that we all have times when we make mistakes and we don't don't do something right. Uh, but I'm here to remind you, I'm here to help you out. This is how we do it. And then we move on and it's not a big deal. We don't, we don't make them feel bad about it. We just start the day with saying, okay, remember this is what's going on. And then, Hey, let's make sure to remind them and keep them moving in the, in the right direction. So for us, it's a little different, uh, during COVID. Uh, we had a whole ensemble that we had to manage and there were no gigs. So that we had many different ebb and flows of uh, not get, not doing any commitments and stuff like that. But the biggest thing that helps us is going back to the previous topic, that, that positive, uh, keeping that positive attitude going. And that helps us keeping that positive attitude. That helps the, the, the Marines, they trust. The, the, that trust and respect goes both ways. So when we go from doing no gigs and then we start uh, accepting more and then all of a sudden we're, we're busy, uh, they trust we, we have their best interests in, in, in mind and to get those, uh, to make that good musical product and that we're not overworking them. Uh, because uh, we, this is our job, and we they, we have to manage that between 
things outside their their um outside the rehearsal, their outer life and stuff they have to do in the Marine Corps and stuff like that. So when we have to, that's one of the ways we do it with that positive attitude uh, and just looking at everything and what we can do and what we can't do. You know, something, if I could follow up on something Dee, Dee said too, when she was talking about rules, it, for me, I know a lot of times young teachers, you know, they have handbooks of rules of so many things. And I found over time that uh, four rules work for me. No gum, eyes on the voice, have your instrument of music every day, treat others the way you want to be treated. And the life, the nature of life lessons in those rules, besides gum, uh, is is one, it's not band, it's not orchestra, you know, it's not performance music, it's it's life. If you want to communicate with someone, you look them in the eye. You don't, you know, don't want to talk to the part in their hair. Uh, you, want to, you want to discuss, you want to have that communication. And, and for me as a teacher, once you have their eyes, their ears follow, and then you're off and running. So the idea for, I would, I would just encourage young teachers, especially as they're reassessing after they have done some recovering this summer to start what we hope will be a normal, normal school year in the fall, because the things that are happening this year in the classroom are not what is going to happen in the classroom next year. Everything is going to, is going to accelerate. You know, most, most middle schools have an eighth grade and then they have two grade levels that are approximately the same proficiency level, but they're not the same age. And so as teachers are reassessing, okay, we're, it's almost like it's a new chapter. There's, it's never been, it's never been truer than now. Um, as, she, as Didi was saying, you know, a lot of reminders, this is how we walk in the room. This is what we do to get ready. This is, you know, uh, how, we, how we dismiss. But fundamentally, those things that they can take with them to every class. They should be looking at their, every teacher with eyes. You know, they should be teaching their friends, you know, treating their friends and teachers with respect because that's how they like to be treated. We have some of those same rules to include the gum, no gum. <laughs> No, I, I love it. And, and I get it. I get it. You know, one of the things, Susan, that we really struggle with, I, I don't think it is predicated to a certain age, like Dr. Drang said, is attention span. All of us are dealing with a smaller and smaller and smaller attention span. But I want to pose this question to our friends. How do we increase engagement and how do we decrease uh, these distractions that can take place across a rehearsal time? How do we increase this engagement? I'll start with uh, Dr. Drain and then we'll send it to Cindy. How do we really get the students engaged, particularly coming out of COVID? You know, that's that's a great question. I think that's something that all of us uh, have been challenged with uh, as uh in some ways, we like to think that their attention span has shortened, but I, I believe the number of distractions have increased um, as, a, as a big part of it. So I think that's the major uh, thing there. Um, but with engagement, you know, um, a big part of it from the teacher standpoint is being prepared for class. You know, I'm excited for class every time that I am there. I'm excited and that gets the students excited. Sometimes they might be wondering why I'm so excited. Um, but I also share, you know, those different musical things that may be happening, why, why this is ex exciting me. But also, you know, I kind of think about, uh, what was that? It was the workout, the uh, in insanity. And they were like, oh, yeah, as opposed to working out for like a long time, we, we do these, these intense intervals. So I literally think of my class like that, where we have this intense time of engagement, then relax and release and then re-engage, you know, and that also to help the students build that stamina uh, for that longer uh, engagement time uh, as, as, as we're working. So, so I kind of think of things that way, uh, just like they did with the workout show, they, they, they flip the model on its head. Uh, but yeah, so demanding that, that, you know, uh, intense engagement time, but also giving breaks. I did learn that that is necessary. It could be two minutes to just, all right, relax, take a break, disengage in order to be able to re-engage. And so that, that has been valuable for me uh, in my teaching experience. 
I love that. When you said the workout part, Dee Dee got excited and I saw her eyes light up and I was like, oh no, <laughs> because that is not my lane, but I get it, the P90X and, and you are so right. That engagement and then coming back, relaxing and then coming back together. Uh, Sydney, what would you say, my friend? Well, for me in the, in the classroom, I would, would suggest that uh, young teachers in particular, but all teachers at all levels, get off the podium and move around the room and um, I know I have uh, in my in, in rehearsal uh, because I have a non-traditional space. I make an aisle down the middle so that I can get to the middle of the third row instead of having to crawl over from the ends of the third row or the back row. And I find that from teaching around the room, a it keeps the kids focused because they never know where you are. And when you touch them on the shoulder, and they're like, oh. And then they, you know, they kind of dial it back in a little bit. Also, it gives you a chance to do a lot of individual assessment without drawing a real focus on the child itself, which can be very intimidating, especially now as we're coming, you know, they're, they're emotionally, they're, they're tender, you know, they, they are, there's just no doubt about it. And there's no gauge and goodness, you know, middle schoolers were already, you know, up and down. I always have said, you know, it's middle school. And if you don't like it, come back an hour later and they're completely different. And so they're emotional. And so as you can, you can walk around the room and work, the band can continue to be doing whatever exercise or uh, activity you have going on. And you can stop and, you know, even if it's just, okay, now that's F sharp, second bell, second bell. And, and you're fixing things without it being, a, stopping the whole class. It keeps momentum going and it does keep the focus on. Also, I think as a, you know, as a sidebar, conducting is for the podium. But teaching is for the room. And I don't care how old you are. It's still true. Now, you get to conduct a lot more as they get taller. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, trying to conduct sixth graders or even eighth graders when you're working on technical abilities and proficiencies out of a technique book, you know, that's not, they're not gaining your best work. They get your best work when you work on the corrals, no doubt, but they're not getting your best work and your best energy by standing on a box. They will get it and they will feed off you as you move around the room. And, and I have found actually it, from a refocus standpoint, it's like magic. It's just really magic. They, you know, once they get used to, you know, because they may have come from a place where that teacher didn't use that kind of approach and they and they uh, become a little bit more accustomed to it but uh, I have a big voice so I don't have a problem with that and you know it's easy to use the sandwich technique you tell them something good you fix one thing you tell them something remind about this and off you go and you use your 45 minutes really efficiently that way we, we've missed this idea of proximity during the pandemic you know we haven't been able to get close to them and um, I, I actually, I have a class called classroom management, which I love, um, but trying to teach them about that, how you can just put your hand on the back and somebody all of, all of a sudden is sitting up or, or just encouraging them that way by getting close. So I think that all of those things are important. You know, we all have that middle school snapper, you know, that we, <laughs> we, <laughs> yes, we get a callus on <laughs> And tendonitis after 30 years, it's true. <laughs> but I wouldn't give it up for a moment. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Drain spoke to it just a little bit, but Dee Dee, how do we how do we give them some time to do that talk time or to have some downtime or 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 speak to something and then pull them back into it to keep them engaged? Um, so my, my main my main uh, job throughout the day is high school band. So uh, in my high school symphonic band class, we do in intense moments of just learning, just like Dr. Drain was talking about uh, earlier. We do some intense moments, but then I will I will stop after that moment and I will ask them some I'll ask them just a, a question, a random question that may have something to do with the music or it may just be something where I need them to snap out of it and, and to break away and just give themselves a moment to think outside of where they were just a second ago. Uh, and I found that just by that simple engagement of them being able to speak back to me, sometimes I do it with them talking and sometimes I do it with them giving me visual cues like uh, thumbs up, who's, you know, who enjoyed what we just did, thumbs up, thumbs down. If your thumb was down, can you give one reason why? And then I get to hear them speak about it. Um, but just finding ways where uh, you can get the, get the engagement piece going, but then allowing them also to engage.
engage with what you're doing. Um, you don't always have to learn with the horn on the face. Uh, it's you learn a lot quicker with the horn on the face and, and learning the, the notes and the rhythms and things of that nature. But sometimes the things that we need to learn come from hearing what the students are gathering from what we've taught them. Uh, so some of the things that I do uh, in class, just to give them that little break of, okay, I've, oh my gosh, that was intense. is just to say, okay, bring it back. How many of you thought that was good? How many for for a younger student was that was that good to you? Was that okay? Could we have done a lot of things better? And they just go around and engage the room, and then I get a few people to speak to me about why they pick those choices. Um, that seems to work really well uh, in in our in our classrooms here in Gulfport. So I, we do have a question for our friends here this evening, and we'll start with Master Sergeant, and then we'll go to Cindy, and then we we'll go to Dr. Drain. Uh, but Master Sergeant, starting with you, we want to know what are some success stories you've had conducting an ensemble, some things that have really worked with getting a lot of things accomplished in a small amount of time. What's, what's been some successes for you? Uh, well, one of the things for me, uh, serving in a professional music organization as uh, one of the Marine bands is I'm always fighting for rehearsal time because I have th so many other different ensembles that we build out of our concert band. And I, usually I'm in front of our concert band or our, our marching band doing that stuff. So to be as effective as I can, I make sure I have a good rehearsal plan. I put list as the main thing, main two things I want to get because knowing me and knowing how picky I can get, I'm probably only going to hit two of those within maybe an hour. So I make sure I do that. Uh, another technique I use is giving instant feedback to the Marines, uh, especially after we work something and I'm like, okay, that may be not quite what I need. I need it more like this, or I will engage like was previous said, previously said, engage the Marines. Hey, so what, what was weird with this one? What did you hear there? And that gets them going on. Um, and also another technique I use, like uh, Cindy said, walking around. As soon as I, I cut that band, I put that my baton down, and I'm off that podium, and I'm engaging them from different points, counting them off from somewhere else in the room, uh, just, so, just to keep them uh, engaged that way. Uh, but just having a good rehearsal plan and trying to stick to it as much as possible and recognizing when things maybe aren't going well and you might need a little break or just a distraction like hey guess what i did this weekend who else did something crazy this weekend or stuff like that just just to engage them when just to get their mind out of that headspace and then all right let's jump back in and see where we're at something i'd like to share as far as classroom management and a success story that I, that has worked for me for a long time um it's not in the classroom itself, but it has to do with, with communication with parents. Um, when I had parent-teacher conferences, I always include the student. It's a three-way, just like Suzuki. And I have found that the student having the opportunity to speak and to share what their concern was, what they didn't understand, how come they're in trouble, what they did or what they didn't do, and that way we don't have, well, Mrs. Hawkins said that, la, 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 but you said that, la, la, you know, it, it's direct communication. And I have found that when I look at that student in the eye and I just say to them, please tell me what I can do to make this a better class for you. And they just, you know, pause. And sometimes I get silence because they do not know what to say. And I'll say to them, I, you probably haven't had, this is middle schoolers, you probably haven't had a teacher say that to you before, have you? And they're like, no. I said, it's important for me to understand what I can do to make this class better for you. And so we have this communication, you know, set up, and it has been the greatest success I have had off the podium in all of my years of teaching and it has always worked there has never been a time when a student when it has not had a positive result and you're communicating with a parent you're communicating with the kid you know everybody leaves that session whether it be five minutes or 50 minutes uh, you know with a better understanding of where they're going I also like to have conferences with parents about positive things I'm so excited about how much improvement you, you are third chair in the honors band this year. I'm so excited. You have grown up so much. You've made, you have matured, you have, you know, you have become a good leader and parents, you know, 
I had one dad one time say, you asked me to leave my work to come for this? And I said, yes, sir, I did. It was important. And he was like, and when he got over being mad because he thought his kid was in trouble and he wasn't, uh, you know, he thanked me. But I think the communication for young teachers, communication, we tend to, we, we are, are careful and concerned because we think we're just a young kid and they're not gonna pay attention. Using the phone versus email makes life so much better because they can't feel the intensity of pounding that keyboard. But voice, tone in your voice communicates all. And so even though it is more time consuming, I really encourage young teachers to take the time to make the call and always recording everything, you know, making a journal of who you've talked to when, so you can go back and say, well, we've talked about this and we talked about this and we talked about this, but it's just that communication that can make your life a hundred percent better in a snap of the fingers by just communicating that, yes, you understand their child and what their problems are or what they're doing well. Yeah, um, that that that's all awesome. I know we're we're si I'm sitting here listening to all of these master educators, and I'm reviewing, making sure that I continue doing the things that they have stated uh, just now. But uh, for me, it's 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 having that rehearsal plan. Um, but I, the 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 step that I take is I send that to the students. So uh, in the marching band setting, the students receive the rehearsal plan every day. Uh, an hour before a rehearsal starts so they know how to prepare uh, and what what they know what to expect that day um, and even in the marching band setting I have it down to the minute um, and I celebrate when we accomplish something faster than I thought we would um, I'm like you know hey hey blue band we are one minute ahead of schedule and they get so excited it's really it's really a kind of weird thing but uh, but uh, awarding those things or and then also saying I prepare them for the next rehearsal like, hey, well, these are the things I'd like to get to the next rehearsal. Uh, and then it's followed up that way. But even in the concert band setting for me and again, I know I deal with the older students. I send out the rehearsal schedule uh, on Friday for the next week so that they know how to prepare. These are the areas we're going to be looking at. Uh, with that. So that's one of the big things that I think really helps with the engagement. They know what to expect. They know what we're going to be working on in rehearsal. They can come prepared and they can be successful uh, and, and we all can be successful as, as a community. So, so that I have found has really worked, worked for me, not just me knowing the rehearsal plan, but the, but the students knowing that as well. That's awesome. I hope you hear me. Um, <laughs> so, Didi, how do we move from this idea? And even Cameron, we're going to get you in here a little bit too because you've been in the classroom and just this idea of how do we move from chaos to organized? How do we? I had a, a wonderful band parent who who saw my band room as chaos sometimes in the sixth grade, and I saw it as us working in small groups on our solo and ensemble pieces. You know, uh, sometimes it's about perception, but how do we move from that chaos to more organized? Um, thank you for that question. I think for young teachers, it is, it is so important that they have a plan uh, and, and, they, and then that they prepare that plan. So it's one thing to have a plan and say, okay, I want to accomplish this today. But if you don't prepare that plan, then, then your students aren't going to exactly know what to do. So once you have it and then you prepare it, then you move a step farther like we've been discussing and let everyone know what the plan is. Um, I think a lot of times chaos happens because students don't know what to expect. They don't know what, they don't know what, what are we doing right now? A lot of, if you walk into a first year teacher's classroom, the fir first couple of few weeks of school, some of the questions you might hear are, hey, Miss so-and-so, what are we doing today? Um, uh, where do I put my backpack? Uh, where am I supposed to, how do I get, I lost my music. Where do I get another pencil? It's because they didn't prepare their plan. They didn't, they haven't yet gotten from, uh, from the concept to getting that concept to the kid. So I think when we, when we talk about moving from chaos to organization, it all starts with knowing what you want to do in your classroom and then practicing those things taking the time to practice how you want your day, your classroom uh, day to flow and how you want it to look. And then involving the students in, in that as well. It's not just a my way or the highway, not, not in my classroom. I love to involve the students and say, Hey, what do you, how do you think we should, um, how do you think we should take music up? What's, what do you think the most efficient way for us to hand in a, a handout? And I let the kids, even at the middle school level, they have great ideas and they have, uh, they have ways that we probably wouldn't even think about of how to do it. 
it. Um, so just involving them in that process and then being consistent. I think I said that first, uh, the first thing I said was consistency. Consistency is key in everything we do, um, especially in classroom management. So if, if we can, can be consistent in how we want things done, it, it really, it, it really just flows from there. It, it becomes an outpouring of what, of how we've taught them is how they will, how they will give us that product back. So just having the plan, preparing that plan, and then making sure that the kids are involved in it. And it's not just a one way street. You know, we all, we make a lesson plan for ourselves every day. My, my college kids come kind of, sometimes kind of fight me about a lesson plan, but Dr. Drain just said the rehearsal plan was, Didi, you're talking about a plan. Cindy's talking about a plan. Master Sergeant, I know you make a plan. We all make a, a lesson plan for ourselves every day. So it, it's not so unusual to, to think about what, what, it's not a foreign thing to make a lesson plan. You know, it's what we do. Absolutely. I would say two things uh, just to add to the conversation. Number one is what we're doing right here this evening. You need to have friends in the profession. I mean, just think about this. This is amazing. You're hearing from a middle school's perspective. You're hearing high school. You're hearing college. You're hearing professional ensemble and years of experience. I mean, all of this works together. When you miss the mark, as Didi was saying, as being organized yourself as the band director, the person who's leading the way, that's okay. Acknowledge that and then call one of your friends and the profession and say, hey, how do you handle this 220 students in one class and you have X amount of time to get whatever done? How would you handle this? And stand on their shoulders. I stand on the shoulders of other giants so that I can see over the mountains in my life. Uh, and I'm thankful for every person on this call here this evening because you have been there for me. The second thing I would say is it starts outside of the classroom. In middle school world, I would organize things before we even went into the room. I would meet them outside. We will all stand outside everybody had a place to stand and I never raised my voice which is you know I learned that from D.D. Pitts uh, she leads with kindness and compassion and that classroom management starts outside the room and uh, I stole this from D.D. so <laughs> it's a public confession now and she would say something as simple as this hey I, I want you to raise your hand when you can hear my voice raise your right hand when you can hear my voice and so all these hands start to go up and the person that's disengaged like Dr. Drain was saying will realize something is going on here and they figure out, okay, I need to be paying attention. And when you have everyone's eyes and everyone's engagement, then you're ready to move forward uh, and give instructions and bring them into the classroom. And it starts right there with that initial step. Uh, Susan, I'm so thankful. My cup is full <laughs> from this conversation. And uh, just this time to spend with each other. It's not just talking to friends, it's talking to family. And I love that. It's so powerful. My friend, what would you say to, uh, to land this plane tonight? Oh, I just think we're just so fortunate to hear these different perspectives. And I think the bottom line is consistency and compassion. Uh, my, my, I had a student ask me one time in classroom management, when do I yell? And I said, mm, when they're bleeding, maybe. I don't know. When that room's on fire, that's about the only time. Because if you can't find another way, uh, then, then there's something we need to really reflect on. So I have so enjoyed this time. And I hope that the, everyone that gets the opportunity to see and hear this um, learn something from it. I know we have all taken something from each other. It's been a wonderful time of fellowship together. Cameron, thanks for leading us down this road. My pleasure, my friend. From Music for All and our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America, thank you for joining us for this episode of Mind the Gap. Yamaha is your partner in music education, not just through instruments and professional audio, but also through teacher resources and support. Visit YamahaEducatorSuite.com as your go-to source for your music program needs and professional development. Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through music for all. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in their scholastic environment. We are extremely grateful for any donations gifted to our nonprofit organization. If you enjoyed this episode of Mind the Gap, and in order for us to continue providing our free educational resources and advocacy materials, please consider giving to Music for All in any amount at musicforall.org backslash give.